purpose of the game, if you will. Each speaker will have approximately 10 minutes, just outline their line of thought or take on the subject matter. After that, we will have what I expect to be interesting and lively debate. Without further ado, Hans Jochen, the is yours. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm from Germany. I'm an energy economist by profession. And uh, the last 20 years, I also learned some of, about climate policy. You expect that I will start from the experiences in my country, yes. And Germany managed to get a special image with respect to the transformation which is up to be done as a pioneer in transforming the energy system. And with this image, there is something correct, of course, but it's in main parts, as far as I see, exaggerated. The experiences we made in Germany, I will share this with you, but in this uh, introductory remark, I will raise uh, three points, three questions. First, I will give a little bit background on the relationship between energy and environment. Then the second part, I am focusing on the future role of gas. And in the third part of my introduction, I will come <coughs> to the German experiences because the transformative experience we made is mainly with respect to the electricity system only. The background, the motive force, the desire for transformation is already mentioned of the, of course, energy system, the whole energy system is rooted in environmental concerns. And I would like to draw the parallel to the first essential energy transformation we had in our history about 200 years ago, the so-called uh, Industrial Revolution. For many people and scientists, is that the example <coughs> which we now have to reiterate. Yeah, it's really a groundbreaking transformation there are reasons to call it a revolution in retrospect. It was really groundbreaking. And it was a revolution in the energy system as a whole. And it was driven by scarcities in the environment at that time. It was mainly as you may remember, in the United Kingdom, it was a scarcity of available biomass for food and uh, energy uh, purposes. It was mainly a scarcity in, in uh, energy for, for power because power production at that time was mainly sailing and running water and using this running water. But if one wanted to have additional um, power production, then you have to rely on animals, and animals were comp keep competing with men for food, and food was uh, equivalent to the space available space in the country. That is background, this scarcity is a background for the revolution to uh, have the, um, the de decision to, to use coal later, to use um, oil, the liquid fuels, and later, 50 years later, uh, the natural gas. That's the background, the scarcity of the environment. Today, 
the transformation, the revolution we are aiming at is also a scarcity. There is, first of all, an environmental scarcity. That's the climate, the global warming problem. But there is another scarcity. We have in mind that. It is the scarcity, or at that time, 200 years ago, we were starting to use a limited resource, a limited natural resource, the deposits of fossil fuels in the Earth's crust. We are now facing, and that reflects the scarcity in fossil fuels, increasing cost of producing further fossil fuels. The leading state or ensemble of states in promoting the transformation today is Europe, and that's not by chance, because Germ uh, the European Union countries were the first where they were starting to use the fossil fuels on their own territory. So they are the first to left this system. And it's also not by chance that the EU is the leading political level for promoting this approach because the EU is relatively new established as a combining authority of the European countries. It is not really settled, but it is ever the aim of such a political newly erected political entity to gain legitimization, but also to gain financial resources by their own. My second remark with respect to uh, the gas uh, subject. I told you already that in Germany the approach for the transformation has been mainly an approach of the for the transformation of the electricity system. Electricity is uh, a secondary energy carrier. And usually we think if we are talking about secondary energy carriers also on gas because it's also a secondary energy carrier. The difference is that we can electricity use directly, it's fit for purpose, using gas and liquid fuels also, means to burn it, which is an expensive and uh, difficult undertaking. But the, the point I would make is up to now in Germany, we didn't really have um, an explicit standing to the gas issue. We promoted the transformation in the electricity part of the energy economy and left the gas subject untouched. But it is impossible in policy. Policy is ever intending a change. So if you change one point and the other is not a touch, so there is implicitly also a change with respect to the perspectives of, of the unattached. Spoken frankly, there was a vision behind the approach focusing on the electricity sector only in having the electricity developing in rising shares of uh, uh, power from renewable sources. It has been a so-called all-electric vision. And the consequence of an all-electric vision would have been that gas is set to expire. With all the assets in my country, the volume of uh, assets in the uh, 600 billion euros are set to expire. 
implicitly by such an all-electric vision. Now we have a change in the approach. This change is mainly driven as far as I see from the European level. The European Commission is preparing a new gas directive, or the revision of the, of the gas directive. And um, the idea is to transform the gas sector in a way which is similar or equivalent to the transformation of the electricity sector. The idea of the transformation of the electricity sector has been having increasing shares of electricity from renewable sources. It is programmed to go to 100% from renewable sources. And the same idea is to apply to the gas sector. And that does mean we intend to have gas which will increasingly more climate neutral until in 2050 we will have only totally climate neutral gas. And that's prepared now in Brussels and the, in my country the gas industry is following this approach and all technical options behind this transformation I will not touch on that really but if I will only say yes <coughs> power to gas decarbonized gas using CCS all that's in the background for this transformation of the um, main um, characteristics of the gas and the coming gas economy my last point is the so-called transformation of the energy system in Germany um, with the electricity <coughs> system only approach. I told already that the vision has uh, been to become climate neutral in 2050 for the electricity sector. And um, in the background, and I think that's what really matters with the German approach, has been a revolution in the research and development approach with respect to energy from, from uh, renewable sources. That is uh, photovoltaics and the wind power plants. The astonishing success in decreasing cost for power production from these two sources is the effect of German R&D policy because we included the R&D policy and using these technologies on broad approach from consumers in Germany in one package. It was a very expensive undertaking but it was a very successful undertaking because the decrease of prices is overwhelmingly clear and the effect has been a global one and financed mainly only from Germany. What is uh, made subject normally that we are pioneers in uh, increasing shares of renewables in the electricity sector is in my view only a byproduct product of the main decision to have this uh, uh, main endeavor in the R&D policy focusing on photovoltaics. And, and so that's my three remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Hans Jochen. <laughs> and now Radosh, the floor is yours. I'm happy that you're actually enjoying Slido. Uh, you can also pose questions, not just uh, foretell how dooms they are about to come. The floor is yours. Thanks. Could you 
you please put the presentation? Absolutely. Um, I'm about to do that right now. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm happy to be here with you. I'm particularly happy to be among the students. Uh, I'm realizing that it happens seldom to me to speak uh, majoritarily in front of students, and uh, I'll make uh, some specific remarks to, to you as a public as well. Um, uh, my name is Radoš Horáček, I'm working in uh, the uh, European Commission, uh, DG Energy. Uh, I'm a specialist in uh, energy efficiency, uh, but I'll try to speak about uh, the energy union uh, as a whole and the EU framework of, uh, of the uh, energy transformation uh, that is uh, upstanding in front of us. And uh, I would like to uh, thank the Dean for the great introduction. You have already said what I have on the first two slides, so I can uh, skip quickly through them. This is what I've heard already uh, from your mouth. Uh, so here we have the targets for 2020, targets for 2030. Uh, it's just to frame uh, what the EU is aiming at. Uh, maybe I should say a word about the targets still. Uh, why do we have them actually? Um, it's sometimes presented uh, as uh, uh, we have them in order to force the member states to do something. Well, that's not really the primary idea of these targets. The primary idea of these targets is to give guidance to the industry to do the right investments. And uh, I see that you have a new, uh, highly efficient building uh, where you combine opening windows with uh, noisy ventilation. And uh, <laughs> I, I think that uh, this type of new buildings, uh, if we know uh, what will be required uh, in the markets in 10 years, the investors today will start investing into the right uh, factories. We are not doing a planned economy, sort of setting the plan and fulfilling it, uh, like it used to be uh, uh, some time ago in this country. Uh, we are simply setting some targets and uh, letting quite a lot of freedom uh, to the markets how to fulfill it so that everyone can uh, pretty freely place himself uh, where he is. It has advantages and disadvantages, so one of the disadvantages of our targets is that uh, we do not, uh, we try to guarantee that we will meet them at EU level, uh, but uh, we do not necessarily always have all the instruments, so we are trying to get the instruments and that's what I will present uh, next. Uh, I will actually uh, look in particular on the energy efficiency field, not only because the, the questions from the organizer went in the direction, uh, but also because it has some uh, funny properties like uh, what do you want from energy? I would want that energy is uh, cheap or for free. Uh, I would want that energy is available everywhere. Um, I would want that it's safe. And I think when you look at energy efficiency as a provider of energy services, it fulfills all these requirements. Uh, it's apparently still cheaper to save energy than to uh, buy a new one or construct new uh, sources of energy. Uh, you can save it everywhere, and uh, once you save it, it's pretty safe. Uh, it also has another interesting property. Uh, every one euro, every one Czech crown that you save on the uh, imports, let's say from Russia or Saudi Arabia, uh, turns back into the economy in the form of 2.7 euros. Uh, so that's why I look uh, in particular into energy efficiency. What do we have as legislative framework? Uh, we have the energy performance of buildings directive looking in requirements for the buildings like yours. Uh, we have uh, the uh, energy efficiency directive setting the targets and some obligations to the member states and also to the undertakings. We have a new uh, regulation uh, on the governance of the energy union. Uh, that one se uh, sets up the process. That one is particularly in in interesting for the investors because they, there is where the member states put together their plans and we as the European Commission we look uh, we look into whether these plans do add up or, or not and what can we do about it and that's also where the investors look into what does the government support what does the government want from me to happen in the next 10 years how can I place myself there uh, do I get investment from the banks and so on uh, particularly happy to speak here at the Economic University because these are the questions that uh, you will be facing if ever you work in the field of energy or energy efficiency in particular. And you will certainly be looking into the plans uh, submitted by the uh, uh, governance regulation. 
Uh, just yesterday, we have adopted uh, 12 new legal texts on eco-design and energy labeling, uh, which are uh, specifying uh, more energy efficient equipment in those uh, 12 different fields on the slide below, and I believe you will get these slides later. Mm. I wanted to show you this to um, make a polemic with two arguments that we hear, I would say, way too often, in particular in Central Europe and in particular in the Visegrad 4 and uh, Czech Republic. And one of them is uh, we can't consume less energy because we are a growing economy. And it's true, Czech Republic is uh, in the European context a rather fastly growing economy. Uh, and it's also one of the countries which is doing uh, sort of the best in terms of energy efficiency. Uh, so you can see that they are topping among, well, on, on, the, on the fourth place. Uh, the red uh, line shows how much uh, the GDP was growing. And uh, <coughs> the green line shows uh, how much energy uh, was saved, how much less energy the growing economy was actually using. We call it the uncoupling of energy consumption and GDP. And uh, we hope it will continue, although the trend over the last three year, years was sort of uh, showing us that we have again growth in the energy consumption. And this is to uh, sort of discuss with the second myth that we hear, and that is we are in the Czech Republic, in Poland, in Slovakia, and elsewhere a highly industrialized, uh, industrialized country. Our industry can't pass itself uh, of uh, energy. It will always need energy, and if we want to grow, it will need more energy. And uh, funnily enough, when we look on the trends of the different sectors, and industry in the red, starting up there somewhere, and going lower, I would say way more successfully than all the other rest. Uh, this brings a third argument uh, which, uh, with which I would like to uh, make some polemics, and that is uh, we, the industry, uh, we, the industrial countries, have done already all. Uh, uh, we need to save uh, on energy in order to survive, so we have done it all already, and we can't do anything anymore. Um, you have seen that they have done a lot in industry, and it's certainly true. But we have heard this argument uh, last year, and pre-last year, and pre-pre-last year, and 10 years ago, and 20 years ago, and still the industry managed to save more and more energy. So I think that uh, it sort of suggests that there is a lot of potential in the industry. I think there's a lot of potential in the Czech Republic. There is a lot of potential in the Visegrad four countries and uh, in the whole uh, EU. So this is uh, uh, the... European Commission's uh, vision of the long-term uh, strategy paper, uh, which is sort of uh, the, the, the EU strategy, or I would say at this, at this uh, stage, uh, some ideas of uh, how we could meet the challenges uh, of the uh, clean planet by 2050. So, uh, this is the long-term uh, strategy <coughs> pathways for different uh, sectors. And I would just like to point to this uh, uh, lined uh, curve or line, which goes basically towards uh, zero emission by 2050. Uh, that's the aim. I think that was also the question that, uh, uh, that you have seen on the Slido uh, a few moments ago, though there it was in global context and we are talking, or I'm talking about the European context. Uh, uh, it's a good question. Will we, will we, uh, will we succeed? Uh, I would turn this question in a more creative way, and that is, uh, what can we do in order to succeed? Because I think uh, asking the question in the right way uh, brings us on the right path already. Sorry. Something happened and my presentation disappeared. I don't know why. Let's try it. Thanks. No worries. Um, and here we see uh, what was happening so far. So the sectors that you have seen sort of before are declining steeply until 2050 in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, here we have uh, here we have similar uh, curves uh, in the past. And you can see that there is a sort of a discontinuum. Uh, the curve slightly nicely decreasing until now, 
and expect it to decrease way more steeper uh, as from tomorrow. Uh, so again, uh, the question is, uh, what can we do in order that to happen? How can we, how can we possibly do it? Uh, the Commission was looking at seven building blocks, uh, which would help uh, decrease the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, you see energy efficiency first. We have a nice slogan for it, the energy efficiency first. That's why it's on the first place. Uh, we believe it's still the cheapest, uh, most economical, and also most ecological way of going forward. Uh, but it's only one element of the puzzle. Uh, the other are equally important deployment of renewables, uh, uh, connected mobility, which is clean and safe, competitive industry, circular economy. You can read the others. I don't need to read it for you. And this is a very nice overview of uh, different possible pathways. I would say uh, this is mainly for illustrative purposes. It's not pick and choose, uh, or maybe you can use it like that, but uh, it's for illustrative purposes at this stage. Uh, those are different, I would say, extreme paths towards decarbonization or towards nearly decarbonization in 2050. Uh, you have also sort of these five scenarios. They aim at uh, two degrees uh, temperature increase. These uh, two scenarios aim at uh, two and, uh, one and a half percent increase, so they are more ambitious. Uh, these ones are uh, more realistic. They are still based on things that we quite well know. Uh, these ones are at this stage sort of more at the speculative edge of what is probable and what is possible. Uh, so. They are pure inspiration. Uh, these ones are already more analytical because they are based on, to a large extent, uh, on known technologies. Uh, and uh, you can see also that these different, I would say, extreme uh, scenarios lead us to different paths, uh, to different uh, conclusions. And uh, uh, at this stage, I would like to say that uh, the European Commission is extremely careful to remain uh, neutral when it comes to technologies. Uh, so uh, I, I would be rightly criticized by my colleagues if I told you that the energy efficiency is the right and the best one, uh, because uh, we can't know it. We really can't know it. It's our estimation from today, but tomorrow the prices of technologies might change in such a way uh, that the picture will change completely. And we at the European Commission, as we are not a plant economy, uh, do not want to pick, uh, pick and choose uh, losers and winners. We do not want to say uh, we think that that one is the best one <coughs> and therefore we will invest in hmm. only that direction. I think uh, our, our, main, uh, our main working mode is to open the paths and not to close any of them and to see what the market will do and help the market when necessary. Well, these are the different paths in terms of investment. Uh, my beloved energy efficiency is quite low and quite flat when it comes to uh, investment uh, needs, uh, but that again doesn't mean that it's necessarily the best option. And uh, I would like to point out uh, to an uh, important dimension of any transition, and that is uh, the, the social aspect uh, or how to manage the transition. Uh, I think my colleague Edward could tell you some words about how they didn't manage transition in the UK uh, when they were closing the mines uh, and closing the heavy industry. And we would like to uh, learn some lessons from the past and start investing into the regions and into the sectors that will be hit by the transition the hardest uh, already now before that it happens so that there is a smooth transition, there is something which starts before the other thing ends. Uh, unlike it uh, happened in some regions, I think also in Czech Republic, uh, that uh, coal mining or steel industry ended. I was for a while there was nothing, and out of the nothing it's much more difficult to build up a new society and a new economy of a region. Uh, so uh, we would like to invest uh, into uh, the just transition, into the regions and sectors uh, that will need it. And that's all what I wanted to tell you on the subject. Uh, I would still spend half a minute uh, because I have uh, students in front of me and I'm particularly pleased about it. 
And uh, I was sort of wondering, take it just as a rhetorical question at this stage, uh, how many of you uh, go protesting? And <laughs> for the climate, I mean, yeah. or you might protest against something. I, I have a feeling that the students who don't protest are sort of halfway students. So I encourage you to protest. Uh, you will find your domain and you will find your fulfillment maybe partially there. And how many of you uh, started innovating in order to make something better? How many of you are founding? I mean, you're, you're economists, huh? You will be working undertakings. Uh, hopefully many of you will found your own undertakings who will do things much differently than, uh, than our generation is doing and than our father's generation is doing. I would encourage you very much to start to undertake, to start to innovate, and to start it now. Uh, you are also quite a funny university, being only economists, uh, very useful people for the economy, obviously. Uh, but innovation is also needed uh, at the technological level. So uh, go out, I, I don't say uh, get your boyfriends and girlfriends in the uh, Cheve Ute or uh, <laughs> in the chemical, uh, uh, chemical university and sort of uh, match the skills uh, to the best of the innovation. But they will need you as well because uh, yeah, they are the technology people and uh, you are the ones who can calculate what pays off. And I'm always in favor uh, that transitions pay off, that uh, they sort of go forward in all the dimensions. So I would like to encourage you uh, to follow some innovators that uh, came from this university. I'm a big fan of, for example, Josef Krusha, who was already making his uh, 3D printers when he was studying here, I think. And uh, I think that uh, some of you will be such innovators, and uh, so start now. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Rajosh. I will, of course, ask you whether you go out and protest. That's just fair. I know that you're not a student anymore. The, you know, the regular way uh, how we, we I, perceive I students, uh, you well probably don't fulfill. I, I was, when I was a student, against other things uh, for change. Uh, I think it goes by waves. Uh, those times it was environment, now it's climate, uh, uh, sort of the priorities uh, and the social mode uh, shifts uh, a little bit. Uh, so I don't go anymore. So enjoy the time now when it's sort of your time. <laughs> okay, we'll get, to, but we'll get to that. But now, Edward, the UK experience, if you will, or take. Hello, everyone. Um, you're never too old to protest. You know, uh, I was on the streets in London a couple of weeks ago. Fantastic experience. I saw the voting earlier, and I'm a bit, I'm a bit concerned that at the moment uh, the, the skeptics are winning. So I'm hoping that well, I'm going to start with a little bit of the challenge. I want to talk a bit about the UK experience on decarbonisation in the power sector and to give you a bit more optimism. It's good to be among economists. I'm an economist myself. It's where the fun is, so let's get into some of the graphs, but don't worry, there won't be too many graphs. That was a very rich presentation from both of uh, Hans Jochen and from Radosh on the Commission and the German experience. Um, I just want to say that I'm going to say something slightly different. The European Commission, uh, bless them, they're a fantastic organisation. I'm a Brit, so it's rare you hear this view from, from Brits, but I think they really have done a fantastic job on the clean energy package. But I would say that we do have to pick winners sometimes, and we do have to pick losers as well. And I'm hoping that Aspects of my presentation will show that um, that's the only way we can really be confident we can decarbonise in time. So thanks, by the way, also to, uh, to Roman and to, to, um, to Joseph for, uh, for hosting and for inviting me to speak. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I just want to start with four trends uh, on the global level. And actually, Roman, in his introduction, did give us a bit of uh, data from that International um, Energy Agency report, which was published last year, and that's the report that showed us that global emissions have gone up to a record level of about 33 gigatons. That's from um, fossil fuels, so that's the area we have more control over. So that's pretty bad news, really, all in, that uh, now 30-odd years after the Rio Earth Summit and some years after the Paris Agreement, emissions and global, global emissions are still going up. But I also want to say that a third of those emissions, um, according to the IEA, came from coal generation in the, not just in Asia and the US, um, but to a large extent in China and India, yes, but also in Europe. We've still got a, a 
problem with coal in Europe, and I know that you will probably know about the coal situation in the Czech Republic as well. In Britain, we've had, a, we've had a, a big coal industry for a very long time. It's been decreasing very, very rapidly, and that's been one of the major drivers of our emissions cuts in the last five to ten years. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, I would also say that it's very important to realise that energy efficiency really is hugely important. If we look at that global report from the IEA, I think it said that there was something like 250 additional terawatt hours of um, clean energy, clean electricity added in the world in 2018. It's about, two, about, about 550, sorry. But the amount of extra demand for electricity went up by about 1,000 terawatt hours. So all of the new renewable electricity added next year, uh, last year only went to servicing half of the additional demand for electricity. So we are running very fast. To, uh, the, the, the target is constantly moving. And there's a reason for that, that part of it, we're, you know, we're electrifying more things. We have to be serious that we have to speed up renewables deployment. And if we're looking at those global emissions, we have to tackle that third. It's about 10 gigatons. Um, that's coming from coal, and that includes in Europe. Um, so that's the global context, and we can talk about some of that in uh, a bit later, perhaps in the questions and some of the discussion. Um, if I could have, um, well, that's, that's me, by the way. <laughs> I work for an energy and uh, environment law and, and sort of consultancy in, in Brussels and London. Um, so, Roman, if we could just have the second slide on there. That's going to talk about what I primarily want to talk about, which is the UK experience on decarbonisation. And you'll see, you know, this is, this is a graph that shows that the, the power sector, electricity, has been what is driving the UK's decarbonisation. So, UK emissions went down by about 40% since 1990, and they've been going down quite rapidly even since 2005, uh, 2012. So, we're on track to meet our target. But that graph there, this one here on the right, the red bar, shows you that the power sector, electricity sector, has, has more than halved its emissions since 2013, that is. Um, so a lot of our decarbonisation, that's around about half in the UK, is coming just from the electricity sector. And you've got to bear in mind that in Britain, almost all of our heat comes from, not all of it, but a lot of it comes from natural gas. So you're looking at about a fifth of the energy supply is, is electricity at the moment. And one of the big jobs is going to be increasing that level of electricity and reducing the amount that's coming from gas in, in heating and for industry and for transport. We're not doing very well on transport. It's actually gone up last year. We're not doing so well on industry. We started to do well. A lot of that fall is due to um, the big recession that happened uh, after 2008. So it's not quite as rosy as it looks there. But the power sector is where the, uh, where the action's been. And I'm going to talk a little bit in some detail for economists about how um, that's, um, that's happened in Britain. So we have an unusual e electricity market in Britain, and that's unusual for continental Europe, in that practically all of the assets in the UK electricity sector are in private hands. So the transmission network, the district network, actually the gas network as well, practically all the generation electricity generation, power plant, is in private sector hands. So it's very important, therefore, that the government in Britain has regulated to ensure that the market delivers the targets that it's set through, first of all, an act in 2008 it's called the Climate Change Act, which legislated for five-year budgets, calm budgets, and these needed to be met by the power sector and all other sectors. Um, it was in 2013 where there was a new piece of energy legislation, and actually, to some extent, the, uh, the European Union legislation that was fi finalised last year on the internal en electricity market has sort of taken some sort of um, aspects of that law and looked at it at European level. And that did two quite important things. Um, it set up a, a subsidy scheme to encourage new investment into low carbon generation for electricity. So one of the biggest problems is getting the investors to get the security for long term projects in low carbon. Uh, and so these were 15 year contracts called contracts of difference. And if you're an economist, you'll probably know what that is. That's a, a strike price. And it's basically a, a way of fixing a, an income. They were, these are strike prices for megawatt hour of, of, of generation. And it's for large scale projects generally. So a couple of gigawatts normally. <laughs> 
Uh, and and the, one of the major beneficiaries of this has been offshore wind. Um, and so I want to just show, um, the first round of these was, was, came out in 2014. And Roman, if we could just have a, sure. oh, I can do you it You have here. the remote there. So it should work. Um, right. right, so this yeah. is, so here we go, right. So, um, we'll pay attention now. Um, these are 15 year contracts for, for electricity generation in Britain. So in 2014, we had the first one, an offshore wind, this is a bid, now it's done on an auction system. So the government sets a, an, an amount of power at once and then companies can bid for the price they'll deliver it. So in 2014, offshore wind came in at 150 pounds per megawatt hour for 15 years. It's guaranteed price. Um, we then had, around the same time, we had a big nuclear power plant called Hinkley Point, which is still under construction, will probably be under construction for another 100 years. And that came in at £92.50, so quite a lot less than the offshore wind uh, auction came in at. After that, we had uh, a coal to biomass conversion. So this is a power plant in, in the north of England which runs on coal and wanted to move to woody biomass, so wood, basically, that it imports mainly from North America. And that was £113 per megawatt hour. Then something very interesting happened in Britain and in Europe, actually. In 2017, the auction, £57.50 for offshore wind. There was quite a, lot of, um, quite a lot of celebration about this. And that's interesting because the wholesale price for energy, either basic market rate for energy, not just electricity, only about, that was not much higher than that. So that was only about, I think it was about 50 or around there. Uh, I don't know why I'm looking at you. I, uh, I think it's around £50 per megawatt hour. Just last month, we had another auction. And offshore wind projects, and this was a big project, two gigawatts in, in the North Sea, um, came in at £39.65. So there is, that is a huge price fall driven by a market intervention around subsidy that only came in in 2014, offshore wind at 150 to, um, to 39.60 in 2000, just, just, just last month, actually a few weeks ago. So it's quite a big success story for offshore wind in Britain. And offshore wind in Britain is one of our primary resources for decarbonisation of the power sector, and the capacity is going up massively every year. I just want to say two more things about the UK sector. Oh, I'm running out of time. Um, uh, is, is that this is the carbon pricing system. I don't know if any of you have looked in to EU carbon pricing and the European Emissions Trading System, which is the Brussels-based system that, uh, that it operates on. Um, this is the system of pricing carbon and the energy sector, the electricity sector is part of carbon trading, so you have to buy credits in order to emit. The, the, the EUAs, the allowances, for many, many years before 2017 were trading at about five euros. There was a big reform in Brussels in 2017, which I remember very well, and since then they've gone up hugely. They've gone up now, so they were trading yesterday at 25 tonnes. So if you put your savings in carbon credits in 2017, you, you know, you'd be doing very, very well. Uh, sadly, I didn't. But um, the UK decided in 2013 to add a top-up to the carbon price, and that was a top-up of £18 per tonne, so quite a significant additional price to add to the, U the EU carbon price. And one of the important things to know about that is that that wasn't so much driving new clean energy, but it was driving coal, and very, very heavy emitters like coal, off the energy bill. It was making coal power almost completely uneconomic. Um, and given that we have a private sector market, you need to be economic to generate. So we can look, just, gr just briefly, in 2006, this is the scale of the uh, reduction. 2006, 140 terawatt hours of coal in the UK, and in 2019, this year, there's only 20 terawatt hours of coal. So there's a lot of coal that's closed in Britain in the last um, couple of years, in the last just under a decade. There's still a lot of coal left. There are 13 plants. One of the interesting things, and we can get into this in the discussion perhaps, um, you often hear, and you'll hear it no doubt here quite a lot as well, that if you cut coal, you'll need to have more gas or you'll need to have nuclear. This is not the case. We just do not see this picture in Britain. So a lot of the coal that's gone off the system has been replaced either by energy efficiency savings, or it's been replaced by battery storage connected to things like offshore wind and other renewables, or it's been connected to demand-side reductions like smart metering and what's called demand-side response. 
we're economists, so we have to make sure we do the demand and the supply. So demand has come down in the power sector. And you've also had a little bit of very, very peaking, so it's very small scale peaking gas. But basically, big gas has not um, replaced coal in the UK, and certainly nuclear hasn't either. And I think uh, you'll see from the, the new nuclear that we were planning to, we're still planning to build, it's considerably more expensive than wind. So the economics in the energy market, in the electricity market in Britain, have been changing radically in the last five to 10 years. And I think these numbers bear that out. Um, I'll finish. Uh, now, well, I'll wrap up. Yes, we've talked about a just transition, or what's described as a just transition, and, and obviously it's a, big, it's a big question here in this country where there's still a lot of coal and there's a lot of people working in coal. And Radosh did mention that in the 1980s uh, there was a very radical transformation of the uh, energy sector and a lot of coal mines were closed. Um, in, just in 1920, there were 1.2 million coal miners in the UK. In 1980, there were 200,000, and today there are 590. So, it's, uh, so under 600 people work in coal mining in Britain now, and it was one of our biggest industries. So yes, and there was a lot of pain in the process in the 1980s of basically you know, making people redundant very quickly. So one of the big challenges is how we deal with coal regions, and in, in, obviously in this country there's a lot of lignite, and that's even more polluting than hard coal. So there's a big desire to get off that, but there is a need to do that in a fair and sensible way. But I, I would say, and we can come on to it, that we mustn't, um, we mustn't assume that gas and nuclear lobbies, other fossil fuels, that is, are going to be the replacement for things like coal. We need to think much more clearly. We need to look at the evidence from countries that are doing it on, on how we use that. There's also a big question on how we decarbonize heat as opposed to electricity. One of the questions we can perhaps come on you know, onto into the discussion is the role for what's described as renewable gas. I'm very skeptical about that. Um, it's the kind of thing the gas lobby are talking about a lot. <laughs> we need to be very skeptical about that to some extent, but we can talk about that. Or whether we do, as, as Joachim was saying, direct electrification. So we start saying heat is going to come from electricity, heat pumps, different designs of buildings, that kind of thing. That's a massively important question for the European Commission and others as we go into the gas market directive, which is coming out next year, as, I, as far as I know. <laughs> we'll see. Um, we've had the electricity directive, and, 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 and you've seen a huge amount of stuff on that for 2030. We need to talk about gas next. We need to talk about transport. But the UK market shows that you don't have to replace coal with fossil fuels, and I think that's one of the big takeaways from this, um, well, from hopefully from this presentation. So thanks very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Edward. Thank you very much indeed. Let's start discussion. Before I proceed with your questions, and uh, thank you very much for those, and I expect more to come. Uh, gentlemen, uh, a question that uh, Radosh actually tweaked, in a sense. So we ask whether we are able to achieve those lofty 2050 goals. So Radosh asked, don't ask whether, but how. How? One single, maybe a sentence, one sentence recipe for success. From your perspective, and I mean, of course, we are in transition, so tomorrow things might be slightly or significantly different. Arush. I would say there is some hope that tomorrow things will be different. Uh, so we are still looking forward to any uh, major innovations before 2050. Uh, at the same time, uh, in what we are preparing uh, as, uh, as policy scenarios, uh, we cannot really count on uh, major uh, technological breakthroughs. So we are typically counting with uh, technologies that are either on the market or market ready. Uh, so, but I, I still hope into this uh, last remark that things will be a little bit different uh, tomorrow. Uh, I believe in the combination of all possible measures. And it's like in the energy efficiency. Energy efficiency, you don't have a big hammer uh, like you could have in renewables and building offshore endlessly and having endless energy. Uh, sounds, sounds, uh, sounds sort of a one possibility for the renewables, but uh, in the field of energy efficiency and uh, when we come into what is the most economic way how to go forward, it would require in every single sector to find the most economic solutions uh, and to find the most economic ways forward. And it's going to be a combination of different instruments. Yeah. Yes, <clears throat> I think 
I agree mainly, and I would like to, to put it in this way. What we need to have is an approach with an industrial technological vision. We have to, to stress, we have not only to go to leave something, but we have to have to the process of phasing in, and that's the process of chances, and that's an industrial uh, process of new uh, of innovation, but mainly new infrastructures. So it must be led by a vision. So I'm not so um, so hesitating to, to 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 promote a vision and decision of infrastructure we have to, to, uh, to have a process of phasing in, yes. Thank you. Um, well, I would absolutely agree with that. You, you, you have to have an industrial strategy and you have to have a vision. And Germany does show that you, you, can, you can do a hell of a lot with prop R&D priorities. I mean, actually, you know, it's not just Germany, but, it, but they have done a huge amount for renewables. The next big step is heating. And, you know, there's lots of discussion around place, someone like Denmark, possibly the next big place to show how district heating and renewables could work. I also think massive amounts of money, billions and billions and billions more of public money, probably backing up private investment and just put the, put the carbon price up to, a, you know, to 100 euros. We need to keep pushing money away from fossil fuel investments, where it's still massively outstripping renewable investments, as your graphs at the beginning showed. So we need to push money away from dirty fuels, put the carbon price up, and have an industrial strategy at European level, I would say. Let me have a follow-up for you. Ed. Uh, I recently visited my friend in Bristol. He is a former... London School of Economics professor, so back to economy and economists. And he told me a, a, a short story about the power of the sea, the tide and the waves, and how it could uh, power uh, a significant portion of the UK uh, for some time already. Uh, however, uh, the sort of a resistance from uh, the lobby groups, mm -hmm. you know, the, the old energy industry is so strong that even though there is a huge potential, uh, nothing major has been developed yet. How to overcome this or how to work with this? And it's throughout the history, it's, it's normal that there is a resistance, a resistance within the power structure. How to overcome that? I think you're, and you, Hans Jochen, you can probably address this issue. I'm not going to ask Radosh. However, if he feels like it, he can obviously chip in. Well, um, for a start, we could stop subsidizing fossil fuels. I mean, uh, there's an NGO called Climate Action, Climate Action Network that did a piece of work on just, totting, just sort of calculating fossil fuel subsidies, including tax breaks and others. And it came, uh, it came up at a, a huge number. I mean, you know, 50 billion, I think, a year of subsidy, going, of implicit subsidy into fossil fuels. That's going a very long way to funding lobbies. I mean, there's one power plant, plant for example, in, in Britain that's getting a coal power plant that's getting 189 million a year of public subsidy, a coal plant, um, <laughs> and they're spending an awful lot of that on, uh, on, 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 on lobbying for more subsidy. So we need to get very serious about tackling the subsidies going into current industry, and that's often led at the member state level. There's a, I mean, I won't go into it now, um, but there's a very interesting uh, state aid case going on at the moment as regards a subsidy for coal and it's particularly related to Britain and to um, Poland. Because believe it or not, despite all the things I was saying about coal in Britain, there is still subsidy for coal in Britain for capacity, for additional backup generation, so security. And there's actually a case on, at the moment, um, which the European Commission and um, Radosh's former director, director general, DG, um, DG Comp, is, 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 now the, is now being taken to, the, to court on for allowing subsidies in Poland and the UK to continue to go to coal and to not treat newer technologies like demand response in the same way. So yeah, it's got to be a level playing field at the, very, at, the very, at the very start before we come on to sort of how we can actually support renewables more. But certainly tackling fossil fuel subsidies is a big one. Thank you. Andrew? I think that's a good example. 
I'm convinced that there is um, uh, a chance, a gap in the development of a special kind of renewable energy that's from tides and a maritime near kind of renewable energy. And this special technology has not been developed in the pioneering phase of the German uh, approach, which was focused on photovoltaic and the wind energy, uh, the tra the traditional wind energy, energy. So I think the United Kingdom should learn and should imitate the German approach for uh, promoting the development of this kind of energy which fits to your country and which gives you a special chance of becoming a pioneer in this technology. A prerequisite for that is to end the blaming that developing such an energy is a kind of subsidy. Yes? We have to discern between subsidization and investing in research and development. And the special approach in Germany was that giving guaranteed high uh, prices for new technologies and we didn't understand that not as uh, subsidies that's the point um, i do Thank want you. to comment on it uh, two Perfect. points how uh, such a particular development of particular technology uh, fits into the uh, European Commission's uh, dogma on uh, technological neutrality. Uh, first, I think is quite a good example, I don't know about this technology, but about many different technologies in the UK, and that's the UK auctioning system, where basically the public authorities auction technologically neutrally. It's pretty difficult, it's not straightforward, but the UK had managed it, and I think uh, if the UK had managed it for the current technologies, why not to include into such an auction this type of uh, maritime energy? Why not to open it to the market, and then when there are enough incentives, economic incentives, market-based incentives, this technology will have more incentives to develop. And then uh, it's, uh, it's quite funny because uh, just about uh, on Monday, I have heard for the first time in the internal discussions uh, this idea of, uh, well, why don't we at the EU uh, make some regulation that would make a market playing field for those maritime energies? And it's a typical area for the EU to act, act effectively, act technologically neutrally, and to stimulate the market which haven't developed uh, possibly yet. Uh, so uh, preparing a future-looking regulation for the access to the market for something that uh, because it doesn't exist, it doesn't have any formal way how to access the market, uh, would be a way how to reconcile technological neutrality and uh, new technologies uh, which uh, uh, you were referring to. Perfect. Uh, thank you. I'm fine with one mic. Can see countries decarbonize their economies as the UK or Germany is the question from the audience and uh, one uh, the audience really wants you to answer, gentlemen. So your short take, is it possible or is given the structure of the economy, fairly industrial still, and many other limitations, possible limitations, uh, a reason why something like that is not possible, at least in the short to midterm horizon? Short take, please, because as it is usually the case, we have 15 minutes and uh, approximately 75 questions. My answer would be yes and no. Uh, so uh, no in the sense that every member state, every state is different, so every state will logically take a different path. I do not expect everyone to take the same path. Uh, yes, uh, when you look as an example, like how does Luxembourg want to decarbonize? So Luxembourg will finance and build offshore winds in the Belgian, Netherlands, and Latvian waters, and they'll decarbonize in this way. Thank you. That's possible. It's not, not on their territory. Uh, yes, there is a possibility. I mean, uh, when it comes to the targets and the, and the legislation, yeah, uh, it's uh, sort of, uh, well, you can ask yourself, is it fictive or is it real? 
when Luxembourg invests into offshore in Belgium and then puts a wire going from Belgium uh, to, to Luxembourg. I believe this is real and legally it is possible. Yeah, that's really interesting because in Germany we understand this question that we have to decarbonize domestically. That really every process in Germany has to be climate neutral or totally decarbonized. That's our understanding. If one opens this aim that import and export is also possible, then it's a totally other picture and uh, much uh, not so, so uh, challenging, I think. But uh, of course, and therefore I was stressing the, the gas issue, <coughs> Decarbonization understood as more reliance on renewable sources means that we have more need for space. And so the import question is the natural escape and we do already import many fossil fuels, especially oil and gas. And I think we should also focus that we will further import gas and oil, or perhaps not oil, but mainly gas. And we have to, to look that this gas is climate neutral. Thank you. Ed? Um, well, we need to make electricity, certainly, and I would say fully energy. A, 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 we need to give it an open border system, I mean, an awful lot. It would help Central Europe enormously if it, if it traded across borders its electricity. When you're moving to a more intermittent, a renewables-based, and this is the lesson from Germany to some extent, um, system, you need to spread out the amount of sort of network interconnectivity you have so that if, it's, if the demand is not, if, sorry, supply is not so high in one area, it'll, it'll be compensated for in different areas. One of the big parts of the Commission's uh, hope of, from this new legislation that it passed last year is to, is to force, well, it wouldn't say force, but to encourage member states to stop blocking cross-border electricity flows and taxing them or putting sort of blockers on them. That would reduce, um, it would reduce the cost of energy, huge electricity particularly for consumers. It would reduce it very significantly and it would make it much, much easier to decarbonize um, with intermittent renewables. But of course, we're still having quite a lot of national energy debates when really we ought to be having more of a, a European level um, energy debate, completing the energy union. It's not complete yet. Um, there's a lot of work still to do. I'm optimistic that the packages that were put together um, at the end of last year, well, completed at the end of last year, will, could do that. Um, because we're wasting so much electricity because we're not allowed to trade it across borders. Well, we, we are, but we're, it's often taxed or it, basically it's blocked. If you, if you did what, what, what uh, people, governments do to electricity, to goods and services, there'd be absolute fury on the streets. But uh, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's not known about as much. So, you know, freedom of movement for electricity. Thank you. Maybe rather uh, a follow-up question, talking about the strategy on decarbonization. How do you see the Czech take on subject matter, Czech policies, Czech strategy? Is it ambitious enough? Thank you for the question. It's not ambitious enough, uh, at least in two dimensions, in the energy efficiency and in the renewables energy uh, dimension. In the renewables energy dimension, it's uh, striking in particular a few uh, new energy, renewable energy shall come uh, into the electricity sector. Uh, there was a, quite a boom of, uh, elect of uh, renewable electricity. It was uh, connected with quite a few scandals. And uh, since then, it seems that the uh, political top uh, in the Czech Republic uh, is very uh, scared or shy of, uh, f uh, is shying away from uh, renewable and electricity. There could be done uh, very much more. I have seen uh, studies uh, uh, commanded by the Czech government, uh, which uh, say that there is not enough wind and there is not enough sun. Uh, as if the wind and the sun would stop at the borders, uh, who traveled through uh, through uh, Šumava or through Krušné Hory has probably seen on the windmill, all the windmills only on one side of the border. Uh, that's the windy side, obviously. 
Uh, so uh, I think there is uh, there is quite a lot of space for increase in ambition, and uh, you are the voters. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, clearly, we have a lot of drivers, uh, conscious drivers. Uh, a question, uh, I don't know whether one of you will be able to tackle it, but can you compare the com consumption, or one might say, a car carbon footprint of a classic car, meaning you know the, the one with uh, the diesel or gas engine, and uh, the electric car, or the car with electric engine? Because there's this notion that, given how still dirty it is to uh, produce electricity, plus you have certain kinds of materials going into batteries and stuff like that. At the end of the day, even though it's trendy, it's not that green. Gentlemen, somebody up for task? Uh, Ed, you, okay. you see my, you, or uh, Radosh? Uh, we have been looking into this uh, sort of out of fun because uh, in uh, my working team, uh, we have many people who are really fans of energy efficiency and of electrical cars, etc. Some of my colleagues wanted to buy it and they were really studying in depth of uh, whether it makes sense or not. Uh, it certainly makes sense as a transition, uh, as, a, as a way of transition. I mean, it is, it is really counting on the future. It's if you ask yourself the chicken and the egg first, uh, is first the idea or is first the materialization? So I think here is first the idea that uh, energy, uh, that, that electric uh, mobility will be carbon free. And uh, the materiality of uh, the answer uh, is we are not yet there. Uh, it does use uh, uh, coal, uh, energy, etc. Uh, and, uh, but we expect it, uh, it to come there. Yeah, uh, the fact that we are not there yet uh, doesn't mean that we will not be there in five or ten years. And uh, when it comes to the numbers, uh, what my colleagues uh, privately uh, have found out is uh, that uh, even with quite dirty coal, it's about the same uh, carbon footprint uh, with, uh, with a cleaner, uh, already with gas uh, power station, uh, it starts to keep towards the benefits of, uh, of the electrical uh, cars. Didn't know you were doing that. That's 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 great. Um, the uh, you have to look at as as you know you have to look at life cycle carbon emissions, and so you'd have to hope that even a a, a, a car that might last thirty years, I mean, would that an electric vehicle even if it was powered off coal now, given hope to decarbonise power between now and you know twenty thirty or twenty forty. That you would hope that in the, in, the, in, the, in the period of time it was, a, it was on the road, then it would eventually, and I think Radosh makes this point quite significantly, reduce, be much better in terms of life cycle emissions than a diesel or a petrol car. Be, you know. But obviously we have, we have to change our lifestyles as well, and I think there's probably an argument for going to more public transport and questions like that. Perhaps with fewer cars, even electric vehicles, on roads um, in the future, but that's, a, that's more of a societal question. Thank you. Uh, Hans Jochen, uh, if I ask, uh, what is the take on the subject matter, meaning electric cars and generally the, the push for more greener automotive in Germany, a country that to a very large extent depends on the automotive industry? I've noticed that uh, there are some new numbers out that say how many people will actually lose jobs and we're back to you know, sort of a social consciousness of this transition or aspect of it in the automotive because of the switch towards electric cars. Uh, can you comment on that, please? Yes, thank you. Yes, I can. Yes, we have the uptake of the electric cars in Germany now really late. And in my view, the main motive is the the EU, the Car Performance Directive, and the decisive date is uh, the year 2020-2021. And you can understand that this is really uh, an impressive situation because the, the carbon uh, the carbon price set by the European legislation, if, you f if one uh, uh, enterprise fails to, to deliver on the targets, is more than 500 euros per ton of CO2. So it's really uh, a kind of carbon price which 
in Germany is outstanding. We are now discussing for the, for the drivers an addition of uh, carbon price of 10 euros or perhaps 20 or perhaps 30. Yeah. So that's really a special policy of the European Commission. A question from the audience. Why didn't the EU officially promise its uh, more demanding commitment in the UN Climate Summit this September? And maybe a, a sort of a follow-up or extension of this question. Uh, to what extent uh, is it about competitiveness or to what extent the competitiveness, the, the take on the subject matter that if we actually push toward more green energy, it comes with the cost and thus compared to China or even the United States that actually under President Bush decided to forego the Paris Climate Agreement and everything that comes with it. Uh, the, the, the notion is that if we go this way and other economies, our competitors don't, then we're going to lose, at least in the short term, obviously, then the mid and long term horizon are slightly different. Uh, Edward, if you have a, a mic, if you don't, um, <laughs> Well, I mean, it's, it, the, <laughs> there's two ways to answer it. I mean, that if, if, if we don't, do anything and they don't do anything and we end up in a five degree world well that would be very good at all for anyone so we should we should all try but the sort of more hard-headed way to answer it perhaps is that and Germany's shown this to some extent creating lead being being first movers in technology in certain types of technology particularly ones that can be exported well like for example solar PV and wind uh, he creates huge amounts of, of competitive advantage for the members countries that are that are doing it and so if we can create lead markets for um, for different technologies that are needed clearly um, you know technology around things like hydrogen and, and that sort of thing are going to be big across the whole world and in a world that is signing up to Paris and to the to, to, to the um, the targets set by the UN um, I think you know it makes a lot of sense for Europe and for European countries to to put themselves right in the in the in, at, at the head of the race for export because clearly yes I mean China and and, and the US are, are also moving along quite well on on some technologies. Um, the, 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 the bit of the, the bit difficult question now um, for sort of today, and there's a debate around things like a carbon border tax, um, which is you know if we want to try and start for example taxing carbon emissions in industry, which would include heat in many cases, um, because they're currently usually given free allowances under the carbon trading system. If we want to start doing that for, for example, things like cement or steel, and there's ways of doing steel now with hydrogen instead of with coal, well, they're very expensive, do you then start taxing imported steel from China or from India? And that would mean you have to put a border tax on. The new commission, or sorry, the commission that hasn't begun yet, but that will begin in November, has said, or well, the, 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 the president's designate, um, has said that she's going, to, she's going to actually try and do this and, and come forward with proposals for a carbon border tax for imports into the European Union. It's going to be very difficult to do, but I think it's the, I think it's the right kind of response to this kind of question. Um, and it, will, it could well help European industry, but it mustn't turn into a protective um, type of mechanism. I would like to add something, yes. Um, there is a fear of the relative uh, competitive uh, situation, but all of us did stress the electricity sector and uh, there is only a small amount of relevance of the <coughs> decarbonization of the electricity sector with respect to international competitiveness. So, so that's perhaps also a reason why we uh, were able to, to, to start with this sector. With respect to the border tax adjustment, I think it's an essential element of uh, the future policy of the Euro European Union, uh, not only for protecting, but also to be able to press other countries uh, to follow. I think that's much, it's also um, um, uh, a power play in that instrument. It's not only protection against unfair competition. 
And you may have in mind that in general, in uh, Texas, that the modern, most modern, most innovative uh, kind of taxation is the, what's that, in the value-added tax. And in the value-added tax, the border tax adjustment is included automatically. And that the European countries were a pioneer in introducing the value-added tax has already been seen by other countries as a kind of unfair competition. In my view, the most, um, or what I uh, would favor is a carbon uh, value-added tax. So that would combine the climate element and the value-added element and the border uh, <coughs> taxing element. Thank you. I might give the uh, institutional uh, part of the answer, and that is uh, when e EU uh, is pledging something uh, at the uh, UN level, uh, it pledges it on the behind of EU where the decision making is by consensus. So this was what was possible for the consensus between the member states uh, and for the uh, legislative process also between uh, the council and the parliament. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, let's say a few months later uh, if uh, the EU had a similar occasion, it would be pledging much more. Uh, the uh, Commission President, uh, the incoming Commission President Ursula von der Leyen is announcing uh, a 2030 uh, target for uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, being a reduction of uh, 50 to 55 percent. Uh, this is a, a significant increase in ambition and uh, I would say uh, to be seen how the member states will react to it. Thank you. Gentlemen, uh, we still have plenty of questions uh, and not enough time. So let's try to do a really quick round uh, question and answer. Ed, can the UK environmental transition survive Brexit? For some reason, this is the top of oh the dear. list at the moment. <laughs> We've got to stay away from that word. Um, I, I hope so. It's a complex and difficult thing to predict. We're importing increasing amounts of renewable energy from um, France and Belgium and, and indeed from the Republic of Ireland. Um, so we need to continue doing that, um, whether we're in the energy union or not. Um, I, I would say it's going to be very difficult to leave the energy union in a, in a, um, well, in a, in a not too damaging way for investment and for the current where we're doing our electricity. Um, but I, uh, I hope, it, whatever happens with that, that, um, that the investment platforms and the sort of legislation we have, I just hope there's a level of sense in the, in, in, in the, in the leaving, if we are leaving, to, that we can keep it going. But <laughs> it's a difficult one. Thank you. Hans Jochen, why is Germany not building nuclear energy plants when France is showing such a great example? with lowering energy costs? Probably uh, the author of the question meant uh, via nuclear. Yes. <clears throat> That's due to the mood, the general mood in the German um, general public. There is a, a majority against nuclear power and we managed to get out of nuclear power and so we have the way to um, electricity system without nuclear power. That's uh, German, German mood, yes. Is it, is, it, is it the right way to go, to forego nuclear at the moment? Yes, I think so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Radosh, if I might ask, what is climate neutral gas? People want to know. Can you give a brief or, or short definition? Mm. Um, something very expensive. Um, <laughs> When we hear about uh, power to gas, uh, uh, how to uh, use excess energy when the wind is blowing a lot and sun is shining a lot, uh, how to use it in order to make, for example, hydrogen. And uh, then I hear uh, these uh, interesting ideas uh, coming mainly from the gas industry, uh, saying that uh, this very expensive hydrogen should be then mixed with uh, natural gas by decarbonization, by the way, natural gas and decarbonization, does that go together? Uh, 
So uh, it's lost of value added in, in some way. So uh, let's assume that the first uh, decarbonized gas would be uh, the hydrogen, which is made from excess renewables. Uh, but uh, at this moment, it doesn't pay off due to the costs of the electrolyzers, uh, who are uh, rich in platinum and therefore extremely expensive as investment. So they have to run basically all the year in order to pay off. And uh, if they run all the year, they cannot run only on the excess of electricity. Uh, so again, we would have to build extra uh, extra electric power stations to uh, to produce gas. And uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit puzzled about this. And uh, as I said, uh, the European Commission tries to be uh, as much as possible uh, technology neutral. So uh, we uh, we uh, will look into possibilities on how to uh, make a gas market transition a gas market regulation that would allow for accommodating even such gas. Thank you. We still got some five or six questions, unfortunately no time, uh, but for one last question, which uh, I will pose, I will misuse my position. Uh, we will tackle some of these uh, uh, with the panelists on the second panel, so don't worry. Ladies and gentlemen, and the last question for, uh, for you, uh, gentlemen, on this panel. Uh, we talked about lofty goals, uh, about structural procedures and structural issues. Let's take it down and uh, use Radosh's uh, uh, last comment that was aimed at the students here. One particular thing we all can do to actually chip in, because one thing is to criticize the European Commission or European Union and our politicians and stuff like that. The other thing is that very often Often we are forgetting that uh, at the end of the day it's all about us and our behavior. Radosh. Uh, shall I walk back to Brussels to cut the emissions from the plane that I <laughs> used for uh, coming here? I, I don't think I, I would manage that. Uh, so uh, uh, at personal level I live in a passive house with an extremely low, nearly zero uh, energy consumption. I would advise it to everyone, to you, it's really nice to live in such a building, not only because uh, you pay less for energy, but just because it's comfortable. Uh, that's on a personal level. And uh, uh, on the EU level, I can only say uh, we do all what we can. And uh, I uh, think I have been able to transmit uh, you some of my enthusiasm. And uh, we are many enthusiastic, co uh, enthusiastic colleagues uh, working on the energy transition. So I uh, hope that the chicken and egg question, uh, what is first, whether the material way, the material knowledge on knowing how we get there, or the idea that we shall get there, and then finding the ways that uh, I think uh, starting with the idea uh, is uh, where we are, and uh, I have a hope that uh, the material part of the world will follow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm not convinced that the focus on consumption is the right one. I think it's a political question and therefore it's totally legitimate to focus on political um, imagination and uh, yes, to engage in these uh, activities. And that's my, my way to live with the climate <coughs> change uh, problem. Mm. Thank you. Edward? Uh, I do largely share that view, but I do think um, uh, it is possible to do things at individual level. Uh, I think diet clearly is going to be one, but the other one might be looking at how we uh, make our, um, our own personal investments um, as we get older, <laughs> uh, if we have any, um, in, into sort of financial securities that are not propping up fossil fuels. And there, there's been quite a lot of movement in financial markets, well, not in fund management generally around creating green funds. There's a very good story in the FT from yesterday, I think, I, I don't know if everyone saw it, that there's, a, there's an exchange tra trended fund, exchange, e an ETF, an exchange traded fund, and a fund that principally invests in green renewables in the US. And that's gone up in value in the last three years, I think, by 50% huge beating of the benchmark and then there's another fund which they've picked which is a principally a fossil fuel um, investor it invests only in really in fossil fuels and that's gone uh, gone up it's gone up a tiny bit or it might have got, has it gone down a bit there is a massive difference now between these two funds it's worth seeing if you can find that article it's in yesterday's ft financial times um and it's just showing the 
you know, if people start really choosing to, to invest their money in funds that are really going for new technology, they might see uh, the they might see the value of their investments go up. But I'm not a I'm not an investment advisor. But it's a very interesting article for for that sort of thing. Edward Robinson, consultancy Connor Raffle. Thank you. Hans Jochen Luhmann, Wuppertal Institute for Climate, Environment and Energy. Thank you. And Radosh Horacek, European Commission. Thank you, Radosh. Now it's time to digest uh, everything that has been said and, of course, more. Uh, so, briefly, three things. There's coffee and some light refreshments for you already. Straight and right to the left at the, very, at the very end. That's one, two. Please come back on time. We were supposed to start 5.30. Let's make it 35 but sharp. And last but not least, enjoy your break.